could be in God's house. Amen. I don't know about you, I'd rather be an old-time Christian Lord. And we live in days where everything is going south, and I'm not talking about geographically. Uh, everything's going downhill in the day in which we live uh, spiritually. Same in the, in the days of Christ. Uh, when Christ first came out, boy, the multitudes gathered to hear him preach, and they gathered to watch him heal and feed them and take care of them. They followed him around until he started uh, preaching to them. When he preached to them, they all left. Uh, that's the way they get. Amen. Been dealing with ancient landmarks. I started last week with the landmark of salvation. Again, you would think it peculiar in the Bible belt to have to preach on the landmark of salvation. I dealt with it last week. They've got perverted gospel down here in the South. They've got the gospel with a little hitch to it, all right? Salvation is tied up in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's called the gospel. And by the way, that is a finished product. Jesus said it is finished. When he died, he said it's been paid for. Hey, don't you like to get something? Say, hey, go out and eat a good meal. I'll say, well, I don't have any money. That's all it's been paid for. All you've got to do is go. That's salvation. Already paid for it free. Cost us nothing. Cost God his son. We dealt with that. I opened it up last week. We live in a place, hey, churches on every street corner. I've never seen so much religion, and I say that because it is a foreign thing to religion itself. Religion is actually the outworking of what's on the inside. It's how we practice what we preach. So religion is a good word. Religion's a bad word because religion is man-made. The word religious or religion is found nine times in the New Testament and only one time did God ever say anything good and that was in James chapter 1. Pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this. All right. So we're talking about salvation. Now that was last week. I want to go to the book of Hebrews this morning. Uh, just get a good understand. But spiritual landmarks, they defined boundaries but they also give us a point of reference where you can go back and find out if you're a little bit off or not that's that's why we're biblicists because baptists are getting off reformed churches they're getting off people getting off all hey they're getting off you say why because one they changed the landmark I uh, listened to a preacher this week, and he, he informed us that in my father's house are many rooms. I thought, boy, we have been downgraded from a mansion to a room just simply by buying another Bible. Thank God in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. You go to the Old Testament book of Psalms, it talks about in the ivory palaces. You say, what are those palaces? They're mansions. Hey, we're talking about the Word of God, it's being, it's being changed all the way around. When you get to Hebrews chapter 5 and 6, he dealt with this, and that's why I went back here uh, this morning. But I want to look at the landmark of salvation. Last week, I got through point A and B of an introduction. So I'm going to try to do a little bit better than that this morning. Now, when you go back to Genesis 3 and 4, God established in atonement what it took to be saved. He shed blood and then he covered Adam and Eve with coats. They made fig uh, coverings, little fig leaves and tried to cover their sin and the Lord covered them from top to bottom. But it, I thank God when he covers you, it's all right. He prophesied the seed of the woman that was coming. They put their faith in the seed of the woman. Matter of fact, in the next chapter, uh, she conceived and had another son. She said, I've gotten a man-child from the Lord. And she thought that the Savior had been born. So we find them looking forward. You get in chapter number 4, you find Cain and Abel. Not going to spend a lot of time with them, but Cain and Abel, ref hey, that story. Cain brought the works of his hand. That's called human merit. He was proud of what he did. And he brought his pride to the Lord and said, Look what I brought you, the best of everything that I've grown. I've got it here. I, his tomatoes were that big around. I mean, he just brought all of that to the Lord and thought the Lord would be proud of him. 
and God rejected him. Abel brought a sacrifice which God required. God requires sacrifice. Teaches us several things. It refutes work salvation. God rejected the offering of Cain. It refutes ways of salvation. God accepted only His way. It refutes self-righteousness. God required blood. It refutes predestination for salvation. God gave Cain a second chance. He said, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. He said, if not, then sin lieth at the door. So we find that it is a, a sin problem. Now, the Lord said, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. You've got to be saved. They taught that to these people. They taught that in the book of Hebrews, but they had a problem in the book of Hebrews that we have today. One, people are ignorant of how to be saved. They're ignorant of it. They, you ask them, everybody's got a different answer to that thing, and, and, or they give you a half answer when you talk about salvation. Most of them don't want to talk Bible with you to start with. I don't know if you've noticed that lately. They don't want you to talk Bible to them. You start discussing the Bible, then they just try to move on down the road a little bit. But we live in, we live in those days, and, and the second problem is sometimes when people get saved and get taught wrong, they fail to grow. Not everybody that doubts their salvation is lost. They're not lost. Sometimes they become a lot. Boy, if I, when I read in the book of Genesis, that rascal, I thought I would set his fanny on fire is what I'd have done with him. But the Bible said in the New Testament he was a just man, a righteous man, and a godly man. That's positional. Not practical, but that's positional. When you get saved, then you get saved. Then we find Demas in the New Testament. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. We hear nothing else about Demas. You say, where did he go? He went to heaven when he died. But he probably went to heaven a little bit quicker than he thought he was going. And God did, did not fill in any blanks. He leaves that up to the Bible and to you. So when you get to verse number 1, chapter 6, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again. That word again is a rolling word, all right? It means you just have to keep going back and, and laying that foundation over and over and over. And he'll deal with that foundation in a minute. But not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and of the eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Now, what was the problem? These people are saved. Look at verse number 4 and 5. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. When you've been saved, you've been illuminated. And have tasted the heavenly gift. I have had a taste of salvation and I like it. They had tasted the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost. We've got the Spirit of, the, of God on the inside of us. The third person of the Trinity lives inside. Now, look in verse number five or six. He said, uh, uh, or verse five, and have tasted the good word of God. I thank God for the Bible. We're going to deal with that again tonight. And the powers of the world to come, we've seen the power, if they fall away. Now, we live in days of falling away. That's not what this is talking about. Thessalonians means deception by Satan in the last days as they are falling away from the Word of God. Listen, that falling away, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, in my lifetime, I've seen churches go from old-fashioned churches down to whatever you call them. Witness to a young lady the other day over here at the hospital. I was over there at the waiting room for a little while and the young lady sat down. Everybody's gone, so I started talking to her. Said she knew she was saved. Thank God for that. But the church she went to is one that teaches them something wrong. I kind of dissected her salvation. So he talks about if they fall away, it's impossible to do something. 
to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, what's he talking about here? He's talking about people who are saved but never grow. And what they do, they just keep trying to get saved again. They make profession after profession after profession after profession. Listen, if God didn't save you the first time you ask Him, what makes you think He's going to save you the umpteenth time? You've got to put your faith in Christ. Not in a prayer, not in an emotion, but put it in a finished work. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Now, you've got the, 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 the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is what he's talking about. Now, what I want to do, I want to dissect this just for a moment. But these were written to the un, not to the unsaved. These, hey, Hebrews was not written to the lost. Matter of fact, your Bible was not written to the lost. It gives verses whereby a man can be saved. But this was written for us. The world will never understand this Bible. The Bible said that the natural man, he understandeth not the things of God. He can't discern the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. But we find in here that these people we're having a problem. If you notice that word therefore in verse number 6, verse number 1. Anytime you see a therefore and a wherefore, you go back and see what it's there for. It ties chapter number 6 to 5. In chapter number 5, you have one of the warning sections of the book of Hebrews. There's five warning sections in there, and you've got one of them here. Starts in verse 12, 4. When for the time ye ought to be teachers. He's talking about they've been saved long enough. They ought to be teaching the Word of God. They ought to have a handle on the Word of God. Do you have a handle this morning on the Word of God? If you've been saved 15, 20 years, 10 years, you ought to be getting a handle on the Word of God. You ought to know what the Word of God says. What the Word of God teaches. We live in days when they don't. He said, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong drink. So he talks about everyone that useth milk in verse number uh, 13. He didn't say that need milk. You go to the book of Peter, Peter said that as newborn babes, you are to desire the sincere milk of the word of God. When somebody gets saved, you give them milk. Eventually, they start eating a little bit of cereal, these babies, and after a while, they start sleeping all night. Milk won't hold them. So you've got to get up in the night and feed them and feed them. After a while, you look, and they're sitting there, and they're feeding themselves off of a table or whatever. You put food in front of them. They get all over them, but they're getting some of it in them, all right? They're, they begin to feed. After a while, boy, you can sure know how to dissect a steak. He said that you ought to be. He used the word oracles in these verses. Verse number 12, he talked about the first principles of the oracles of God. Oracle is, simply means a utterance or something that has been spoken. The word of God was a spoken word. Then they took the spoken word and made a written word with that. They had the spoken word of God. These Hebrews, they had the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. You need to understand they didn't have that. But he said that the oracles of God, Jesus Christ spoke the gospel. He did in John chapter 3. They understood that. Then he used the word, the principles. Principle means a foundational or fundamental truth. A phrase used, and it uses that definite article, the. But it means the one and only, or one of a kind. It's the precedent that's set, or the commencement, or the concrete upon which something stands. It's a corner. It takes the weight. Then he used the word first. You say, what's first mean? It means first. Listen, you're never going to go on with God until you get the first down. 
This is building. I learned with math years ago. Mathematics is their building blocks. A lot of people have with math, uh, have a problem with math because they fail to get some of the building blocks along the way. I don't know if it was the same when you were a child, but when uh, we were in the third grade, that was a very important time in school because we learned our multiplication tables. Anybody remember that? You don't learn the multiplication tables, you're not going to go very far. You've got to learn that. It's a step. You take when you get into high school. You simply, you can have, there's different types. They had business math to where you just, if you didn't want to take uh, mathematics itself, but you had first uh, algebra one, algebra two, then we went to plane geometry, solid geometry, trigonometry, calculus. You get on up into differential equations. Uh, you get into probability and statistics, and you start increasing in these. You learn logarithms. You learn these building blocks that will take you to the next course. And if you don't get that course, you're going to strike out in the next one. That's the way with the Word of God. These are building blocks. The first, these people chose to willfully remain ignorant, ignorant of the Word of God. Now, let's look at verse number one. Therefore, a continuation of context. He's just simply tying you back here, all right? He's not done with this crowd in verse number 12 of chapter 5. He's trying to give them some help. Why? Wow. They were doubting their salvation because they had not grown. They were re-crucifying Christ every time they said, Lord, save me again, save me again, save me again. That's what the Mass does. It's a re crucifixion of the body of Christ over and over. That's what it is. A lot of people continually have problems with their salvation and never get it settled. So I want to say this morning, get it settled. If you've got an issue, don't let that issue ride. You come talk to me. Don't, you say, well, I'm ashamed to admit it. Listen, let's get the thing right. I, I, we're just here. I'm here to help. I'm not here to see you struggle with something that you can get nailed down in the Word of God. And by the way, the only way you'll ever know you're saved is right here in this Bible. That's why he talked about the oracles, the spoken word. He talked about the first principles of the Word of God. He said, therefore, leaving. That, that means to walk away or move on. Don't remain a spiritual doubter in the days we live. Then he used the word principles. We've explained that to a degree. It's a first fundamental of salvation. Get it settled, move on. All of the doctrine. The doctrine is a topic, a tiding, a treatise, utterance, a word, a work, a belief, or set of beliefs held and taught by the Word of God, and then of Christ. Notice what he said. It's the doctrine of Christ. Now, what we're going to deal with this morning is not my doctrine. It is a Bible doctrine, but it is a doctrine that was put forth by an individual, and his name was Jesus Christ. Christ set the foundation. That's why they said he was the head of the corner. They rejected that foundational stone. We don't normally put cornerstones unless we do that uh, just as a memorial or something. They'll put a cornerstone, put a blast brass placard on it or something and I tell you why, when the building was built and why it was built and all this type. What this was, this was the first block that was laid. Then everything, it had to be laid just exactly right. It had to be perfectly level. It had to be perfectly uh, right in its position it, because that building's going to come off of that stone and it was the stone that took the first weight. Years ago, I built a two-car garage on our house in Kentucky, and we were on a hill, so a footer had them dig it and then poured that thing, but poured extra concrete on the front uh, part away from the house because that was the downhill side. That, that's where the weight's going to sit. When you put your brakes on, on a car. You ever noticed how the back brake pads will last 100 to 200,000 miles? Because all the weight goes forward when you put your brakes on, the weight is forward on that car, and these back brakes are not doing it. He's talking about something here that's foundational. 
Now, I want to look at the latter part, leaving the principles. Now, he lays down two principles. He said, let us go into perfection. But he lays these principles down. What are the principles of salvation? Let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation. You don't need to go back and lay a foundation again. The foundation's been laid. When Paul spoke of the judgment seat of Christ, he said, I laid the foundation. Now, everything you do builds on that foundation which is Christ. But he sets forth two things here. I'm going to deal with them just shortly. Not laying again the foundation, one of repentance. Is repentance necessary for salvation? God said it is. But he gives you a description of what salvation is. You hear a lot of people, well, you need to repent of that sin. You absolutely do. But repentance, notice what he said, from dead works. What is repentance? It is repentance from dead works. That is the fundamental description or definition of what it is. Now, when we repent, the Bible said it's a godly sorrow not to be repented of. It takes you back. Once you have laid this foundation of repentance, you, you will never change your mind if you lay that foundation right. So I want to look at the foundation of repentance just for a moment. What is it? From dead works. What is salvation? It's not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. Boy, that bunch of braggarts. I couldn't imagine walking around heaven and them walking around telling me how good they were and, and they got here because I was a really good person after I got saved. Boy, isn't that a blessing? I lived for God. I lived a righteous life. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And you walk around and have to listen to that for an eternity. When you get to heaven, the only one that's going to be glorified is the one who laid that foundation. His name's Christ. We sing these songs, look for me at Jesus' feet. But hey, you don't, don't, hey, don't you worry, we're all going to be at Jesus' feet. I thank God at the name of Jesus. He talked about things on earth and under the earth and in heaven. They're going to bow to Him. I thank God for that. So we find that repentance is repentance from dead works. What's he talking about? He's talking about when you get tired of trying to be saved, then you'll get saved. As long as you're putting out an effort. I, people tell me, well, I treat my brother right. I, I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't run with these. I don't run with these. And I'll, they just tell them, I ask them, are you going to heaven? They say, I'm doing my best. I'm trying. Had a guy the other day said, oh, I know I'm saved. And then he started talking about good works. We have to realize that personal merit in any degree will nullify the grace of God. He spent a lot of time, not only in Galatians, who hath bewitched you, but also in the book of Ephesians. He said that we're not justified by our works. We're not made just by our works. Why? Isaiah said in 64, 6, all our righteousness are filthy rags. We're of an unclean, we're unclean in ourselves. Paul dealt with that over in Romans chapter number 7. He said, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He said, the things I'm not supposed to do, I do them. You are, are you that person? Paul was. He said, the things that I don't need to be doing, that's the things I find myself doing. You ever, you ever do something, and by the way, your sin is intentional? It has intent. We come to a place, we know right, we know no wrong. We, we say, Lord, I'm going to choose right, and we do wrong anyway. He said, you've got to be saved. You've got to detach yourself for these, from these things that you're doing that cause you to think you're either right with God or wrong with God. Let's take somebody that's already saved. Why do they doubt their salvation? Because they do something wrong and say, I don't believe a, a Christian would ever do this. I must not be saved. No, you've got to put your faith in a foundation that is laid. When 
When I go up in these buildings, I thank God for the foundation. Now, repentance from dead works. I often use the phrase, you bring a bankrupt sinner to Christ. Night I got saved, I was helplessly, hopelessly lost. You never get saved until you get lost. I'll never forget that night as long as I live. I'll never forget that church building burnt, but I could take you and put my finger on the spot. I sat in a th over a thousand people there that night. And I sat there that night stripped down to the bears. I mean to tell you, I knew for the first time in my life, nobody had to tell me I was lost. They didn't have to tell me I was helpless. They didn't have to tell me I was hopeless. That night I knew that in my hand, Lord, no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, O Lamb of God, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. It's repentance and dead work. It's when you realize that you cannot merit salvation. Then you spend the rest of your life repenting of everything that God requires. I thank God I didn't repent of drinking. I didn't repent of smoking. I didn't repent of cursing. I didn't repent of not going to church. I didn't repent of not tithing. I Listen, you can, you know that old thing, I go to heaven, somebody said, you got to write all of your uh, sins on a big chalkboard and you're writing on chalk and climbing a ladder and somebody steps on your hand and you say, what are you doing? Said, I'm coming down for more chalk. You can't remember everything you've ever done to repent of it. And by the way, a lot of our sins are sins of ignorance. You say, I'm not accountable for it. Oh, yes, we are. They sacrifice for sins of ignorance. The Bible, hey, even in our society, ignorance of the law is no excuse. You break law, you break law. What's he talking about? He's talking about a foundation of repentance, not from sin. Even though we do. I repented. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I did things wrong. But that night, I knew I could do nothing to get to heaven. See, putting your faith in Christ is coming to the, reali hey, the realization that He is it. It's all Jesus. It's all God. So we find that repentance from dead works is a total lack of human merit before salvation, after salvation. These people were doubting their salvation and therefore they remained children, small babes in Christ. Hey, he loved them, huh? He said, hey, of many of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you dull of hearing. Some, sometimes people just turn their hearing ear aids off. They turn their ears off. Listen, turn your ears on to the Bible. You cannot get saved with personal merit. So you turn from self, and then what do you turn to? Faith toward God. That's why I believe that repentance and believing are so tied together you cannot divorce the two. When you repent of your sin, you are turning to the only thing that will save you, and that is your faith in Christ. Where is your faith? He said, get your faith established. I say, and I don't have any problem with that this morning. I am not fit for the kingdom of God. Never have been on the best day that I ever had before I was saved or afterward. I have never felt that I was right with God. You say, preacher, you saying you do hey, I don't think I've ever been perfectly right with God in my humanity. But I thank God this morning He's been perfectly right with me. He covered all our sin, past and present and future, when He died on that cross. Somebody said He didn't die for future sin. He sure did. He died for mine. I wasn't even thought of yet. Thank God for that. So we find 
these principles. One from dead works. Over in Romans 3 it said we conclude that a man is justified by faith without deeds of the law. Romans 5.1 Therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8-9 For by grace are ye saved through faith. Repentance from dead work. And then we find the direction. Notice what he said. Not the faith of God. And of faith toward God. You find a direction of our faith. Listen, I've, I've got faith in things within myself. But salvation is a direction of faith. It's to put your faith in one who is invisible that you've never seen. I love old doubting Thomas. Everybody gives him a hard way to go. He wasn't there when he should have been there. Jesus came. He was missing. He was discouraged, laid out. The Lord had died, and he didn't know what to do. And he just thought, well, I'll just stay home from church today. And he missed him. They told him about it. The next week he came to church, and Jesus came again. Hey, he came for Peter. He came for Thomas, too. What's God want? Hey, you may be a doubting Thomas this morning. God wants to restore your faith in what He did. He said, reach forth your hands. Put your finger in my hands and thrust your hand in my side. And He said, be not unbelieving. He said, I want you to put your faith in me. Thomas didn't do either one of them. I can see him throw his hands up and say, My Lord and my God. And then the Bible said, Blessed are you. Hey, you've seen and believed. Blessed are these. Have, having not seen, they have believed. I've never seen Jesus. But my faith went toward Him. I asked God to forgive my sin. And I asked Christ to be my Savior. I asked God to save my soul that night. Now, not a feeling. I didn't get any feeling. You say, oh man, I got a wonderful feeling. Well, thank God for it. But what if you hadn't? Would that mean you're not saved? But I went home told my wife I got saved. Went home told her I got saved tonight. And boy, God began to work in, in our hearts. But I'm talking about a salvation. You see, these people had a problem up here. He was at, over and over and over again. They were going back and laying that foundation of repentance, but not from dead works. Hey, you'll repent the rest of your life. But I thank God when we get to heaven, we'll never repent of anything again. But I have never forgotten what God did that night. I had a godly sorrow that work of the repentance not to be repented of. I've never gone back and said, well, I was wrong. I didn't think I was, I was helpless that night, but I really wasn't. I go back to the night I got saved, friend. I know I was helpless. And I have never gotten over that. That's what he's talking about. We're talking about salvation. What is it? One, it's singular. There's a way that seemeth right unto man to end there of the ways of death. You say, well, I'm of another denomination. I am of the denomination, not Baptist Bible. This is what God said. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. That's singular. And the ways, that's plural, there are of the ways of death. That means all these different ways they've got out here are ways of death. There's only one way to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way. It's an eternal salvation. Boy, they don't like that. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me and I give unto them probation. And if they behave themselves, they might have a chance. You know, these people that believe you can lose your salvation, they lie to the people they witness to. If I believed I could lose my salvation, I'd go up, lead somebody to the Lord when they had asked to be saved, and I'd tell them, now you can still go to hell. They don't tell them that. Oh, you can still go to hell. Huh? Let me tell you, I thank God this morning I am fireproofed. I thank God this morning I don't worry about hell. I'm talking about an eternal salvation. The Bible said, Whosoever believeth him should not perish, have everlasting life. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I send to he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed. 
from death unto life. Roman chapter 8, who will separate us? Nobody. Boy, I thank God. The Bible said in 1 Peter, we're kept by the power of God. Then it's a life-changing thing. Now your life's going to change. You didn't give up anything to be saved. But now, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now God begins to require. Not self-merit. If you're saved, you're as saved today as you were the day that you asked Christ to save you. You, you need to get that settled. You are saved. I like that song that says, Saved and forever I am. Hey, man, I, I like that song. But then we find that we become that new creature in Christ. Why? Because the foundation was right. It's not of works. It's faith toward God. And now all of a sudden the Spirit of God comes in and starts cleaning our life up. It's a universal salvation. I know people don't like that word universal. They tell me, I, you're one of those universal church men. I believe that Jesus Christ died for the church. I believe He died for all mankind. But the church is a called out assembly. One of these days, thank God, the Lord Himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And we are getting out of this place. When I went to the funeral on Friday, I went by to see Tracy. She wasn't there. Got a picture. How many have been to... Tracy's grave. Got a picture of her and Binky. About that big, beautiful, beautiful color picture embossed within that stone. I took pictures of it. Got down close. I didn't know it was 2003 when Tracy went home be the Lord. That's been 21 years ago. Seemed like just a night that's passed. But I thank God she's not there. I went there just to remember her. It's a gracious salvation. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. The landmark of salvation has been moved and in some churches totally removed. It's gone. I'm talking about in the Bible Belt this morning. Churches everywhere preaching, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. I'm going to quote Paul. Paul said, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. Hmm? You say, Preacher, are you free? I thank God that I'm free. Not free to sin, but to serve. But at the same time, I thank God this morning that I cannot lose that which I could not gain. You can't either. The landmark of salvation, what is it? It is finished. It's in the death according to the Scripture, buried and resurrected again, raised again from the dead according to the Scripture. I'm glad he put according to the Scripture. It's not the passion of Christ that you see on TV. That is Mary giving her son, not God giving his. That is nothing but Mary Olatry is all that is. That's worship of Mary. I thank God this morning that we have a foundation, one of repentance from dead works, and then a foundation of faith toward God. You say, preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved, then get it settled. But if you have asked God to forgive your sin and asked God to save your soul, then you need to be anchored here instead of going back, being dull of hearing, hearing the Word of God, but not hearing the Word of God. The Bible said He gave them ears to hear, but they could not hear, and eyes to see, but they could not see, and hearts to believe, but they could not believe. You say, why? Because they were willfully rejecting what God said. I thank the Lord that salvation is a landmark that we cannot move. It is anchored in Christ. Let's stand this moment. We're going to have an invitation. Just want to go back and finish that. I was reading in the book of Acts the other day, chapter 16. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He said, what should I do? Boy, he was going to do anything he had to to get saved. They said nothing.
They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen.